Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 412, the post-GAFCON analysis. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Gavin Ashenden. And it's the 29th of June, which is the Feast of St. Peter and St. Paul. And for many of us, the anniversary of our ordination, for me, the 37th. Um, God has been very gracious and the church very patient. Congratulations. Okay, I've been back in America now for about four or five days. I'm starting to get back in my time zone. I don't just sit in my, my office. Like the day one, Monday, I just sat here, drooled. I was tired. <laughs> I would doze off to nap. Uh, you know, but uh, I, I thought it's a great time now to uh, do a little analysis uh, post GAFCON uh, because from my perspective, it was great. From your perspective, it could have been better. From George's perspective, he's probably also doing the time zone thing. And um, I thought it would be a great to, chance to talk about that. Um, first, uh, you probably now have a new understanding by meeting all the people who are fans of, of the effects of the show on the Anglican Communion. Kevin, it, it was just wonderful. Um, I felt a little bit like a movie star. For a moment <laughs> <laughs> well because of your english accent you you were like the lost beetle I and mean, people go oh, is that gavin that's gavin oh i want to meet gavin i'm like yeah that's that's gavin over there yeah people were people were so very generous and of course because of the way media works people knew us and we didn't know them mm -hmm. well we know them now and it was just wonderful um and i i came away thinking uh well really what an incredible job you and george have done over the years to make this ministry available to so many people. For a lot of people, it really is a, a kind of umbilical cord to the church to give them a sense of what's going on and, and where they fit into it and how they belong. So um, God has blessed this as a venture. It's very effective and let's pray we can keep it as effective. And it was really wonderful meeting some from very good friends in the spirit. Mm -hmm. It's so great. Well, one of the conversations you had with me probably towards the end was why does this work? And I think Anglican mm. Unscripted works because the three of us, four of us, five of us, all of us uh, behind the camera here, were disruptors. Uh, disruptors to um, the church that's gone uh, awry, that's not on target anymore. And that's why it's effective because so many people think what we, what we say and they, they enjoy listening to people with a, you know, a commentary like that. Well, I think that's true, but I, I'm not. I'd like to say we're reformers. Sure. I mean, there's a good semper reformanda. Um, the Lord is always trying to renew each one of us and also the church. Um, and uh, we're, we're so we're, we're disruptors where it's where it's it's gone wrong, and we need to disrupt the process of decay or or misdirection. But there's a business of reforming, which is also trying to put it right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's um, that's a charism of the Holy Spirit. So in so far as we're in the Spirit then we're doing something creative and redemptive for Christ. And I think one of the big issues is a lot of people think man is trying to reform the church. No, God is constantly trying to reform yeah. the church. Yeah. Um, it's always astray. It's always just a little off. Go back to Acts, and, and every epistle was written to a church that was basically a little off, sometimes a big, you know, a lot off, <laughs> and uh, sometimes, you know, just completely, you know, uh, heretical. And that's the point. Um, God is always I, working I've, to reform. People have been talking about this, and every so often somebody uh, um, reflects back to the Reformation mm -hmm. uh, and suggests that the issues there haven't been properly dealt with. I feel very strongly this is a serious mistake. Uh, the Catholic Church has assigned a concordat with the Lutherans about agreeing on salvation by faith. Uh, and what we're facing at the moment is a new Reformation. And the reason that's important is because it requires not looking back, but looking forward. Mm -hmm. And it requires the people who want to be orthodox to come together in a fresh post-First Reformation, pre-Second Reformation allegiance and alliance, where we have to sit light to some of the things that uh, characterized our churchmanship in the past and prepare for the way God wants to use it in the future. We have a very different battle now. And actually, one of the useful things was, a talk that um, I was involved with with Melvin Tinker on on 
the new Marxism because Melvin in particular made a very clear pitch for what this new Reformation is all about. And, and again, that's part I something I think that Anglican Unscripted is playing its part in. Oh, sure. Now, I have many interviews that I've conducted and put on tape that I'll put up over the next couple of weeks. Um, it just wasn't... I didn't want to interrupt the live stream that was going on by posting a, mm -hmm. a lot of interviews. We did a couple of Unscripteds, if you haven't watched them from there. Um, let's just sit back a little bit and... Uh, talk a little bit about GAFCON. This is your first GAFCON. Obviously, you watched from afar before. Um, no, general sir. general impression, obviously, it's the best game in town. It's truly amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, truly, truly amazing. To uh, Kevin, I met some incredibly imp impressive Africans. Mm -hmm. I, I knew that many of the African priests and bishops and laity were impressive. I, I've met them before. So my, my second Gafcon, I was at Nairobi. That's um, right, you were at right. In 2013. See, but, that's but, the time zone uh, thing I'm talking about. I just <laughs> mush. But, but this was this was this felt as though it was on a very different scale with a different mm -hmm. purpose. Uh, I was very inspired to be shoulder to shoulder with some big, holy people mm -hmm. and I liked it very much um, so I think one can divide one's reflection in, into two what was it like as an experience well it was great this is the gathered church proud to be an Anglican proud to be an Orthodox Anglican seeking to reform the church but then there's a there's its political significance what was its job bringing all these people together in 2018 and did we do it and actually uh, one doesn't know till one reflects um, and my reflection is, no, no, we didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to look at this just from the leadership point. Um, Canterbury and the four instruments of unity are not doing it as well. Um, they have fallen greatly short, uh, so much so um, that something like GAFCON can really come out with great press, great leadership, great uh, communique, and... Uh, Canterbury and Lambeth are bewildered. How did they get away with this? How did they bring so many people uh, into uh, Jerusalem? And especially, how did they convince all these people to pay to go to Jerusalem when we offer a free ride into Lambeth in, in 2020? Obviously, they should, they should, we should be able to outnumber them here in Kent, uh, England, uh, compared to Jerusalem. Free versus paid, alone. That's interesting. Uh, yes, it is, and it's it's one of the differences, one of the dynamics at the moment. And there's another dynamic, I think, which is the difference between Canterbury and Gafcon that's taken place between 2013 and 2018. Mm -hmm. So in 2013, uh, Justin Welby turned up at the last minute um, on the pretext of going to a place he never went to, so that, which wasn't true. People didn't know it wasn't true till afterwards, but it set a pattern of Lambeth not telling the truth. Uh, it wasn't the first time and it certainly hasn't been the last. But he preached a sermon and people listened to it respectfully. It, it missed the mark, mm -hmm. but he was there. We, sometimes we all preach sermons that miss the mark. It's okay, he can be forgiven. He would never have dared to come to this one because in the last five years, what's become apparent is the heterodoxy that he's presiding over and the hypocrisy he's doing it with. I'm sorry to say it so clearly, but uh, he's doing one thing on the surface and uh, an entirely uh, another heterodox project under the surface, and it's enormously serious. Now, the reason I think the GAFCON this year missed the mark is because a number of people still think that um, there is scope for calling uh, Canterbury and the Church of England uh, and tech uh, the, the, the churches of the of white majorities, uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, America, England, um, South Africa, to repentance. Uh, but there's no sign that they will repent. Uh, quite the opposite, they're speeding up the other direction. So if making a biblical and orthodox statement calling people to repent isn't going to have the effect of calling to repent, what should one do instead? Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer is we should have a different kind of Anglicanism. Uh, schism is a dreadful thing in, in the Church of Christ, except there are moments when, if the part of the Church is going so badly wrong and can't come back, then to collude with that is um, is a greater sin than disunity. Uh, and I think, in my judgment, that's the point that we've reached. In fact, if I, if I can, I'd like to read from a, a blog by uh, Geoffrey Kirk. Sure. Geoffrey Kirk was a very well-known Anglican in... Um, 
the, in the 90s and the year 2000. He led the Anglo-Catholic movement and he joined the Ordinariat, having come to the conclusion that the Church of England was lost to the faith. Um, and so he wrote this, uh, just, just 10 lines. Uh, another GAFCON conference in Jerusalem, another carefully worded appeal to the churches of the liberal West to repent and sub to submit themselves to scriptural authority. When will they ever learn? The provinces of the white ascendancy, the US, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, cannot repent because they believe that their pansexual agenda is a response to a moral imperative which trumps the demands of the Bible. Uh, then he talks about an, an address with, uh, which, which told it like it is, but was nobody listening? Uh, there is no way back for them. Uh, now this, is, this I think is hard for us to hear, but, but I agree with him. To beat the tired drum of evangelical fervour will not turn the tide. To continue in the communion in what amounts to armed neutrality, bolstered by dated rhetoric, simply means the liberals will pick them off church by church. The press has begun in South Africa, with the rest it's a matter of time. I think he's wrong about the tired drum of evangelical fervour. Evangelical fervour is never tired, yeah. and uh, it's something that refreshes us. But I think he's right politically. Um, the, the, we're, we're behind the curve in terms of the spiritual fight to heal and purify the church. Uh, there's no doubt at all that Lambeth will indeed continue to do what it's been doing, which is to pick off the African provinces one by one. Um, and uh, and certainly when we were talking about the statement, which was a wonderful statement, you can't fault it. It was, it was biblical and enthusiastic. I spoke to an American whom I, I met at uh, Christchurch in Jerusalem, and he said, what did you think about the statement? And I said, well, it was too weak. What we need is a separation of the ways. And he said, well, I was part of a group that, that, that diluted it because we were trying to help the Africans. I said, well, I can understand that. And that's part of the balancing act. But by helping this particular African province, you've done us in England a great disservice. Because for as long as people think that Anglicanism is one group with, with a kind of um, a tension in between it, rather than two entirely different directions. We won't be able to wake the residual Anglicans in England up to the fact that they're moving in the wrong direction. And so that was my, that's my reservation about what we came out with. Hmm. There needed to be some separation, in, in England in particular, but ideally throughout the world, of the communion that is led by Canterbury and Anglicanism as it's expressed and believed in by the Gafcon provinces. Now, you know who Jules Gomez is, right? <laughs> yes, I do. Okay. I, I, I read his most recent uh, post uh, about uh, abolishing the Trinity uh, in order to uh, 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 help the Muslims and, and uh, uh, Canterbury get together. And I'm watching the response. And a lot of people either don't understand satire or think that this is wholly possible in the Church of England, that in order to be loved, they would abolish uh, their understanding of the Trinity. Um, and it went one after one, and about 13 comments in, you guys know this is satire, right? Have you guys ever heard of the <laughs> Babylon Bee? This is just like the Babylon Bee. And nobody would believe it. No, this is Church of England. I, we believe the Church of England would do this. Um, and I kind of say, Gavin, I'm one of those. George... <laughs> Kevin, it was incredible. It was it was so funny. Uh, uh, Jules wrote it as a as a as a piece of um, therapy. He was so frustrated about particularly what had happened with the celebrations of, of Eid and Istar in the cathedrals. Sure. And um, and as you read it, some of the names ought to have made it obviously that it was satire. A, a bishop called um, the Right Reverend Pandora Dulali. <laughs> So I'm going to find it very difficult not to think of the Bishop of London as sure. the right Reverend Pandora and Valley from now on. <laughs> However, um, but 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 yes, but the reason it was so effective was all he did was to project the direction the Church of England has taken a step or two further, uh, accommodation with Islam in order not to upset people and to, uh, in the name of good disagreement, foster multiculturalism. And since at every stage. Christians have given way, in England at any rate, to Muslims. The Muslims have changed nothing, 
given nothing. They don't celebrate Lent in their mosques. They don't venerate Jesus or allow Gospels to be distributed. Um, they, they don't wish us Happy Christmas and Happy Easter. Uh, they've changed and they give nothing in that regard. Mm -hmm. For some strange reason, Christians have bent over backwards to accommodate them. So all Jules did was to take that on a click or two in the journey. Um, and, and the fact that people swallowed it shows how degenerate and how far things have gone it was very funny as you yeah, say it was it was um, it, it never was heard really of funny. <laughs> it really was i'm very powerful for it yeah all right so uh the future now uh you saw the interview i did with archbishop venables and i asked him about uh the desire for gaft Khan to go into england and he indicated it, it didn't work and you and i have had conversations like that um i've and walking around and talking to a lot of English people at GAFCON, they're like, yeah, it, it didn't work, or it hasn't worked yet, uh, but they're still holding out hope. Um, without getting too controversial, what do you think uh, <laughs> is... Uh, I don't want to get in trouble. I'm always in trouble. I hear you, Kevin. I hear you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, as gently as possible as a, a bishop, uh, what, what do you think is not working? Not too disruptive then, yes. only a bit disruptive. Just a little bit. <laughs> We've already had a, a good 21 minutes of disruption. We don't need to be, to, you know, all that out. But yeah, this was a topic that you and I talked about many times uh, off camera. And then I got, I got a chance to confirm it with uh, English people who were um, at GAFCON. I, I, I want to kind of briefly talk, talk about it here and we'll talk about more in the future too. Uh, so, so two not very disruptive things, but an observation. First of all, we suffer from party spirit like nobody else in the world. There is something about the gradations of English culture. So that the, the GAFCON contingent um, of English were separated, I think, into about 12, a, a dozen tribes uh, expressed by uh, school, accent, geography, mm -hmm. theology, theological preference, society, grouping, um, uh, taste. And uh, it was it proved very difficult to get a sense of what kind of allegiances could be made that would draw even everyone at GAFCON together. Um, but I think it was partly because it was predicated on the idea that, that those who identify with GAFCON in England can win something. Uh, that if we ally together, there's something that we can achieve. Uh, Melvin Tinker made a very moving short speech in one of the English groups saying, guys, wake up, you've lost. Uh, there isn't anything you can win institutionally or synodically. He said it very clearly with the integrity he brings to these things. And I think people heard it. And then a woman called Lisa Noland, who works at the sharp edge of the gay issue, mm -hmm. said, uh, you should be praying for the return of Rowan Williams. That surprised people. She said, with Rowan, uh, he wasn't on your side, but he allowed you a place at the table. And then she mentioned a couple of women bishops and said, they hate you. Yeah. They don't want you in the church and they'll come against you uh, and, and you do not have a safe place within the Church of England. People were very surprised to hear Lisa say this. Um, she's a very clever, gifted American with a PhD and a lot of experience and she spoke with obvious authority. So the thing that these two people said to the English contingent greatly surprised them and I think and I hope it woke them out of a sense of um, what might have been uh, um, theological optimism, which they mistook for political hope uh, and complacency. I think that, therefore, the English group um, ought to realise that there is no future in the Church of England for orthodox theology. It'll be more and more constrained and more and more undermined. Already, for example, if you want an orthodox curate trained in an orthodox college, you have to share them with a liberal parish. So it's quite clear what will happen. You, you know, liberal curates will be shared with, with orthodox parishes and the other way around. So um, there has to be a plan for rescuing orthodox Anglicans outside the Church of England. And a lot of people found that too difficult, too frightening, too daunting a prospect to entertain. But until it's entertained, um, we will go on experiencing something like the Babylonian captivity. Um, and then we have to ask the Lord how we can be set free. Uh, so I, I, I hope that's not too provocative, but that's how I and quite a good number of other people saw it. 
Oh, no, I, I don't disagree in, in the least with you. And uh, it was uh, nice to have a conversation with uh, uh, Archbishop Venables about, the, about that same topic. All right, we, we've come up against the clock. What are we doing here? 20 minutes. It's time to move on. Um, now, I made a mistake, and I'm going to blame the time zone. I introduced this as episode 412. <laughs> I've been memorizing 412 all the way through. <laughs> You're not going to tell me. <laughs> it's actually 413. You know, <laughs> it's the way it is. I'm Kevin Carlson. <laughs> I'll let people know. I'm Gavin Ashenden. And it turns out <laughs> you've been listening to episode 413 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> <laughs>